Hello. Um, so my name is Ann Deitch, and I'll be talking about Section GG. So I think, um, let's see, let me get the next slide up. Great. So um, I'll be talking about Section GG, Functional Ability and Goals. So um, I am a registered nurse by training, and I was very fortunate when I um, got out of nursing school, worked in rehabilitation, and then later on worked in acute care. And a lot of what I learned uh, in rehabilitation really helped me be, I think, a better nurse even in acute care. And so I'm uh, really pleased to be able to talk about function uh, in particular uh, related to this uh, section of data collection. Um, since we are talking about function, I also wanted to mention um, in nursing school, I learned a lot about the hazards of immobility. Since that time, there's been so much research about the benefits of early mobilization. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with a lot of that work, but it is so important. And so I feel um, it is very much a privilege for me to be involved in the work supporting CMS talking about functional improvement and functional abilities. The, um, in terms of presentation, I have about 45 minutes. I know you've been sitting for an hour and a half, so I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. It uh, didn't seem fair for me to uh, have everybody uh, think about mobility and patience, and most of you are probably very busy during the day, so go ahead and stand up and just get some blood flowing so that uh, you're ready for this next section. And um, we will get started. So thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so in terms of objectives, um, first of all, we will be uh, talking about the intent of Section GG. So again, it's all about uh, self-care mobility, so mobilization. We will define helper. We will talk about the rationale for each uh, item within Section GG, and we will describe the time frame associated with those items, and we will discuss the steps for assessment uh, for each of the items in GG. And we'll go through scenarios, so similar to what uh, Jen and Sharon did earlier today. We'll go through some examples together. There'll be polling opportunities, so get your clickers ready for that. I do want to explain the quality measure that um, um, was uh, the basis for these items being added to the um, MDS. And um, I do want to say that the quality measure, it's called the application of the percent of long-term care hospital patients when the admission and discharge functional assessment and a care plan that addresses function. So this measure was actually developed originally for the long-term care hospitals, but it was adapted for use across multiple settings, including skilled nursing facilities. So that's why you see the word application of, and don't be distracted by the fact that it says long-term care hospitals. This measure, again, was adapted for use across settings. So basically, the numerator for this measure is the number of Medicare Part A covered resident stays with functional assessment data on admission and discharge, and at least one goal for self-care or mobility is submitted. The denominator is all covered Medicare Part A uh, resident stays. Certainly, um, as we kind of the last few questions talked a little bit about unplanned discharge, so I'm going to actually pick up on that right now. Um, when a resident has an incomplete stay, collection of data might be challenging. So if um, a resident has some kind of medical emergency, it just might not be feasible to worry about their mobility status. Obviously, if they need, uh, the person needs to be um, taken to an acute care hospital or emergency room, that should be the priority. So as part of this quality measure, we basically say that for residents with incomplete stays, for example, emergency transfers, admission functional status data is required Setting a goal for that in, uh, patient is required, but discharge functional status data would not be required. Again, that is for uh, the residents who experience an incomplete stay. So I will define that for you a little bit more. So residents who have incomplete stays are those residents who have some kind of medical emergency. Uh, a person who leaves the skilled nursing facility against medical advice, 
or um, a patient, who, a resident who passes away in the skilled nursing facility. All residents not meeting the criteria of the incomplete stay should be considered to have complete stays. This quality measure is not risk adjusted, and the rationale is that as part of the function, functional assessment that we're asking you to um, report, we do have the codes available that indicate the person is too um, ill or too complex to be able to perform an activity. So for example, if um, um, a person has a swallowing problem and cannot eat by mouth, you would be able to code 88, let's say, um, that the person was uh, had a medical issue or there was a safety concern related to swallowing in this particular example. And so you would code 88, and that is a valid code. So you have done the assessment and indicated it's not safe for the person to perform the, the activity. So um, again, the uh, complexity of the patient should not affect whether you can code all of the items. And we'll be going through the coding, obviously, um, during the next um, 40 minutes or so. And then after break, we'll also pick up and reinforce a lot of the information. So um, Sharon gave you an overview of the IMPACT Act. So this is one of the measures that is uh, associated with the IMPACT Act. Again, it is a cross-setting quality measures, and the items in GG are uh, required to calculate the quality measure. These items assess need for assistance. So as we talk through the examples and I go through the rating scale, we're always going to be worried about how much assistance is required for the person to complete the activity. The items, again, there's basically three types of items. So one set of items are focused on admission performance. What is the resident's ability to perform uh, some daily activities and how much assistance or need for assistance is there associated with that performance? There are goals we'll be talking about. Again, the quality measure requires a minimum of one. We'd love for you to report more than um, one. If the, the resident maybe has some goals related to self-care mobility, you can fill out all of the, the goal items. And then uh, the discharge assessment is also based on performance similar to the admission assessment. So we um, have uh, received a lot of questions about GG um, over time. And so throughout this presentation, I'll be uh, mentioning a few things to reinforce uh, some of the issues and address some of the questions that have come in. Um, so one question that we have frequently uh, received about section GG is, which staff members should complete this section? So the response to that is that you should refer to your facility, federal, and state policies and procedures to determine which staff member may complete an assessment, as resident assessments are to be done in compliance with facility, federal, and state requirements. Typically, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, and nurses are the typical staff involved in the assessment of self-care and mobility. So within your um, skilled nursing facility, you would have uh, your own policies, but certainly um, the clinicians that I just mentioned uh, would be involved in, in many circumstances. One of the other things that I wanted to highlight is um, the definition of helper. So I'll be speaking a lot about helpers providing assistance. So the, for the purposes of completing GG, a helper is defined as a facility staff um, who are direct employees and facility contracted employees, that is, the rehabilitation staff, the nursing agency staff. It does not include individuals hired, compensated, or not by individuals outside the facility's management and administration, such as hospice staff, nursing, CNA, students, et cetera. Therefore, when helper assistance is required because of a resident's performance is unsafe or poor quality, only consider facility staff assistance when scoring the amount of assistance provided. If you look in your packets, you will see a copy of the section GG items. And so it looks very similar to part of what you see here. So um, section GG at the top has the rating scale. The six level rating scale that we'll be going over is on the left side. 
If a resident is unable to perform an activity, there are several codes that can be used that are on the right side of the, the page there. And then in the self-care area, there are actually three activities that we'll be talking about today that are on the um, MDS. As you can see on this particular graphic, there are two columns on the admission assessment. The first column is where the performance on admission is reported. There are two spaces for the codes because um, some of the codes go to two digits. So if the person is scored independent, that's actually a six, and you'd report 06 in that first column. There is also room to report the discharge goals on the admission assessment. We'll be talking about that as we get through our slides today. And then if you look at the discharge assessment, you will see that there's only one column, and we are just interested in learning the person's functional status at the time of discharge for those three self-care activities. So the rationale for these particular items, um, so during a Medicare Part A SNF stay, residents may have self-care limitations on admission. In addition, residents may be at risk for further decline during their SNF stay. In terms of the steps for the assessment, and this is directly from the MDS manual, um, the first uh, information to know is that this is an assessment, and so you would assess the resident's self-care status based on direct observation, first and foremost, but you can also supplement that information with information such as the resident self-report, family report, direct care staff reports, that are documented in the medical record. It is a three-day assessment period, so uh, the day of admission is day one, and the day after admission is day two, and the day after the day of admission is day three. And it starts with the date that you put in the A2400B start of the most recent Medicare stay. Residents should be allowed to perform activities as independently as possible, as long as they're safe. So again, if um, I'm a nurse taking care of a resident, I you know, let the person uh, perform eating or um, toileting hygiene as independently as possible, and then I can report on the person's status. If for whatever reason somebody's in a hurry, maybe getting to therapy, and so a lot of hands-on assistance is provided, the person is not allowed or didn't have the opportunity to be as independent as possible, that's not an assessment. So it's important to make sure that the person is allowed to be as independent as possible in order to accurately score the items. Third, um, if helper assistance is required before the resident's because the resident's performance is unsafe or poor quality, only consider staff assistance when scoring according to the amount of assistance provided. Activities may be completed with or without assistive devices. So when uh, walking is being assessed, for example, the person may be walking with a cane, they may be walking with a walker, they may be walking um, with lost strand crutches. It would still be scored the same way based on the amount of human assistance. So the fact that somebody uses a device does not mean their score goes up and down. But again, you're always just thinking about how much assistance is provided from a helper in order for the person to walk, let's say, 150 feet. Section GG items should be code, coded based on usual performance or, or baseline admission performance for admission or discharge status for discharge, which is identified as the resident's usual activity performance for any of the self-care or mobility items, activities, not the most independent performance and not the most dependent performance over the assessment period. So just to kind of bring that to an example, um, if somebody is admitted and maybe, you know, during the first day they're uh, admitted to the SNF in the afternoon and so they're getting settled, maybe family members are helping them do um, some walking or helping them with uh, toileting hygiene, going to the bathroom, and so it's maybe on the second day when an assessment is officially done by a therapist or by a nurse in order to determine how independent that person is with performing 
toileting hygiene or walking. Refer to facility, uh, federal and state policies and procedures to determine which staff members may be able to complete an assessment. So I already spoke about that a little bit earlier, a few slides ago. Um, again, just for reinforcement, the resident assessments are to be done in compliance with facility, federal and state requirements. So in terms of the um, coding instructions, so um, again, this is completed on admission and discharge. Um, if somebody has an unplanned discharge, the items are not, the Section GG items are not on that data set. So if you indicate unplanned discharge, you won't see those items. If you say it's a planned discharge, you will see those items. The first uh, level of the rating scale, it's a six level rating scale. Uh, it is an independent scale meaning a higher score indicates more independence. So at the top of the scale, you'll see level six is called independent. And the definition of independent is that the resident completes the activity by him or herself with no assistance from a helper. The next level on the rating scale is level five. Level five is called setup or cleanup assistance. And this is the level that's coded if the helper receives either setup and or cleanup assistance. The residents completes the activity. So for example, let's say we're talking about eating. So the person actually eats um, by themselves, but somebody has to maybe open containers. So something has to happen before the person actually does the activity of eating. So again, the resident completes the activity. Helper assistance is only provided prior to or following the activity, but not during the activity. The next level um, that we will be talking about is level four, which is called supervision or touching assistance. And this is the score um, that would be used if the helper provides verbal cueing or studying assistance, um, and the resident completes the activity. So uh, let's say it's walking. Uh, so the person is able to walk 150 feet. Let's say we're scoring the 150 feet item. And so if somebody needs to provide verbal cueing, maybe the person uses um, a walker and they're not using it correctly. And so the therapist or the nurse is providing guidance in terms of how to use the equipment so that the person is safe, then that would be a level four. Another example would be um, for touching assistance, which is also coded level four, um, let's say the person is walking 150 feet and the nurse or the therapist is actually providing contact guard or just touching assistance as the person walks 150 feet. When it comes to the supervision or touching assistance, the assistance may be intermittent or throughout the activity. So for example, it may be that um, maybe somebody becomes just a little bit unsteady when, when they're at the marker of, let's say, 50 feet to 60 feet um, for whatever reason, but the rest of the time they don't need any steadying assistance or don't need any cueing or super uh, cueing assistance. And so in that case, you would code level four. You would also code level four for somebody who received contact guard assistance throughout walking that 150 feet. One of the important issues in terms of um, scoring any of these items is that the reason that the person requires assistance is not um, documented. So you're just saying that assistance is required for the person to be safe. And I wanna just bring up examples where um, walking, it may be that somebody um, has some balance problems and so it's a physical issue that the therapist is providing or the nurse is providing uh, studying assistance. But you could also have an individual who um, maybe after experience a, a, a brain injury or a stroke, the person walks extremely well, but they are not safe to walk by themselves. They might walk out of your skilled nursing facility. And so somebody has to supervise because of cognitive issues. And so either case, its supervision is required. So we're not you know, saying why supervision is required, we're just saying supervision is required. So we will probably come back to that and perhaps you'll have some questions about that. 
but I just wanted to be sure that that message was um, conveyed. Next on the scoring level is level three, which is called partial or moderate assistance. If the helper does less than half of the effort, the helper at level three is providing more than touching assistance. So in that instance, it may be that the helper is providing lifting assistance, is holding or maybe supporting somebody's limb or really steadying somebody's trunk so that there is a significant amount of support. It's more than touching assistance. And in this instance, uh, the helper is providing less than half of the effort, which means that the resident is putting in more than half of the effort. Next, we go down to level through, level two, <laughs> And you will um, think it makes sense that this is the next one down. So in this instance, actually, the helper is doing more than half of the effort. And so the um, examples would be that the helper is providing quite a bit of lifting assistance. The helper is maybe um, providing a lot of support in terms of holding limbs or lifting limbs if it's part of a transfer. So again, the helper is doing more than half of the effort, and that becomes a level two. And then the resident is actually performing less than half of the effort. Finally, level one, the resident is dependent, which means that the helper does all of the effort. The resident does none of the effort to complete the activity, or the resident requires the assistance of two helpers for the activity to be completed. We've had many questions about why two people, um, the assistance of two people would be coded level one. And that's because there's a significant burden associated with two helpers assisting patient, one resident with one activity. And just think in terms of um, a resident who is, let's say, being discharged to family, um, caregivers at home, and if that person requires two people to help with a transfer, the family has a significant burden in terms of having two individuals help this pay, uh, resident perform that transfer at home. So certainly um, uh, we've had some examples where uh, the, the resident has been described as somebody who perhaps uh, you know, is very obese and requires two a, a person assist and would probably always need two person assist because the person is very obese. And so again, um, if the person is going home, requires two people assistance, that's significant for the family to take care of that person. So it may be that person um, is coded dependent um, at discharge for that. I mentioned before that um, in addition to the six level rating scale, we also have codes available to indicate that an activity was not attempted or the activity was not completed. So the first of these three codes, which again is on the right side of your page, um, the first one is 07, which means that the resident refused to perform an activity. So let's say for um, an example, um, somebody refuses to walk 150 feet, you would be able to code 07 on admission to indicate you know, there was an interest in that there wasn't necessarily a medical issue going on, but the person refused to do the activity. A second code that is available, um, again, also on the right side of your page, is the code 09, which is not applicable. And not applicable is defined as the resident did not perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. So it's possible that you have an individual um, who is admitted, the person perhaps um, experienced a stroke several years ago, has been uh, mobilizing using a wheelchair for many years, and so um, um, maybe they can walk very short distances but not long distances, and so they never, they have not been walking 150 feet, let's say, for um, quite some time, and so if you're coding on admission, the person's ability to walk 150 feet, you might say it was not applicable because the person didn't, had not been walking prior to the current um, new stroke that the person experienced. 
Finally, the last code uh, that is available to indicate that an activity was not attempted or completed is code 88. And from our experience, this is the code that we, will, we think you'll be using most often when you're using this set of codes. And code 88 means that the activity was not attempted due to the person's medical condition or safety concern. And so basically, um, if somebody has experienced, um, let's say, um, a stroke and has swallowing problems, and now they're unable to eat, this is new, uh, you would code 88 for eating if the person was not able to eat by mouth. So let's say the person was only able um, to get nutrition through a G-tube in this instance. So next, what I wanted to do is to spend a little bit of time helping you to think through how to code. And so what we've uh, got on the next, I think, three or four slides is um, kind of decision trees and questions to help you think through. And you can use these as you're going through the case study that we'll be going through later today. And um, the examples that we'll have up on the slides, or if you're looking at manual examples, you can think through these questions and it should help you get to the correct code. So first and foremost, uh, we start at the top of the scale and we'd say, does the resident need assistance? And when I say assistance, it can be any type of assistance, whether it's physical assistance, like studying assistance, verbal assistance, uh, nonverbal cueing, it could be supervision, cleanup, or setup assistance. Any of that kind of assistance um, would be taken in consideration when you're, you're answering this question. So does the resident need any kind of assistance to complete the self-care activity? If the answer is no, you would code six independent. If the answer is yes, the person does need assistance, then we'll need to go through the rating scale and some additional questions to figure out what is the correct code. So the second question is, does the resident need only setup or cleanup assistance from one helper? If the answer is yes, you would code five, which is called setup or cleanup assistance. If the answer is no, then you'd go to the next question, which is on the next slide, and then the question becomes, does the resident need only verbal, nonverbal cueing or steadying, touching assistance from one helper? If the answer is yes, you would code for supervision or touching assistance. If the answer is no, then we're gonna go down to our next question. Next question is, does the resident need lifting assistance or trunk support from, with one helper providing less than half of the effort? If the answer is yes, you would code three, partial or moderate assistance. If the answer is no, then we go to our next question, which is, does the resident need lifting assistance or trunk support with one helper providing more than half of the effort? If the answer is yes, you code two, and that's the substantial maximal assistance. If the answer is no, then we'll go down to our last question, which is, does one helper provide all of the effort to complete the activity, or is the assistance of two or more helpers required? And in this instance, the code is one. So I do want to highlight, um, I don't think I mentioned or thoroughly covered this um, when I went through the rating scale. If a resident performs some of the activity, so there's some effort the person actually does, um, so let's say, um, for you know, a toilet transfer, the resident does some of the um, assistance, they would, the person would be coded to. Uh, level one means that the person is basically uh, dependent, totally dependent on the staff for assistance or the assistance of two helpers. If the resident does a little bit of effort, but two helpers are required, and I think we've had several questions where um, one person, let's say, is providing some trunk support as the person walks, but the person's gait is really um, a concern, and so one person it ne is needed to follow behind in a wheelchair. So even so, in that instance, two helpers are required, and so that's a level one automatically. So even though the person is doing a little bit of effort, in this case, the two helper required becomes more important, and the code is one. So um, if the person does not perform the activity um, or do, is not able to complete the activity, 
then we would like to know why. And so again, the codes are seven if the person refused, nine if the person did not perform the activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, or code 88 if the activity was not attempted due to the person's medical condition or safety concern. So um, just, I think uh, Jen covered this a little bit for just for reinforcement. So the five-day PPS assessment um, would be um, where you're reporting the admission assessment, and it's the Part A PPS discharge assessment. Uh, you're reporting the discharge information. We have some coding tips that are in the manual. I'll just reinforce some of those with you. Um, so when, if you're relying on information from the medical record, um, so when you're reviewing the medical record, um, that is certainly a source of information if you're the person who's gathering the information in order to put an accurate code. You might be interviewing staff. You might be observing the resident. One key issue is that you really need to be familiar with the activity, and this becomes particularly, I think, important uh, for the skilled nursing facility setting when we get to toileting hygiene. Um, I know that in section G there's an item called toileting, and so there's an item in GG called toileting, hy toileting hygiene, which is different, um, and also there's toilet transfer, which is a separate item. So part of the examples that we have in the manual and part of the examples we have today it does get a bit tricky, um, and so we'll reinforce that just to make sure that's clear. But I will be going through the definitions and kind of highlighting what is and is not included. But if you don't know the definition to the activity, it makes it hard to score. So a lot of our examples are focused to help you understand what the activity is. Um, but you might be observing the person multiple times. You might be um, asking other staff how independent the person was, let's say, for eating. And so, again, it'll be important to know exactly what you should be asking for. So we have a few examples in the manual, which are interviews. I think we've got a couple in this slide set also. So um, there is an example that um, I have related to eating. So with eating, which is GGO130A, you're, in order to score that, you need to determine the type and amount of assistance required to bring food and liquids to the mouth uh, for the person in order to swallow the meal once it's been presented on a table and tray. So type of assistance gets back to those questions. Is it just supervision? Is it queuing? Is it physical assistance? Is it setup assistance? And then if there's physical assistance, then it'll, to differentiate between level three and level two, you need to know who is performing more of the effort. If the patient is providing more than half of the effort, it's level three. If the patient is providing less than half of the effort, it's maximal assistance, substantial maximal assistance level two. The next bullet, um, when coding the resident's usual performance, use the six-point scale or code the reason why the activity was not attempted. Again, record the resident's usual ability to perform activities that are uh, performed multiple times. If an activity is only performed once, the assessment can be based on that one assessment. Do not record the resident's best performance if somebody just does something once, but it can't be repeated during that three-day assessment period and the activity is, conduct is um, performed multiple times. Um, if the person, again, is admitted and the family or staff is helping them get ready or maybe the person's in a rush to get the therapy and so somebody actually helps uh, feed somebody more than the person really needs, um, that is not an assessment. Again, it should be based on an assessment. Do not record the staff's assessment of the resident's potential capability to perform an activity. So, um, you know, you always have those circumstances where you th think, well, if the, if the bathroom was much bigger and the toilet was, you know, in this different position, the person would be maybe more independent. But you score what you actually see. It just makes it hard to be reliable if you just start saying, well, you know, if the room was bigger, if this was different, if this was different, the person would need less help. So score what actually happens in order to provide uh, reliable information. If the resident does not attempt an activity and the helper does not 
complete the activity for the resident. Code the reason, again, we've talked about seven, nine, and 88. So again, uh, first of all, determine if the activity happened. So did eating by mouth happen? If it did not happen, then you go to these other codes. But if somebody actually performed the activity for the, the resident, then that's a code of one dependent. Again, if two or more helpers are required to assist the resident with one activity, code level one. To clarify your own understanding of the resident's performance activity, ask probing questions if you're getting information from other clinicians or other staff members. If you're asking, you could certainly ask in general if the person needs help, but then you'd need more detail if the person does need help because you'd obviously need to ask similar questions to the previous slides. Was it only setup assistance or was there physical assistance that was required? If it's physical assistance, was it touching or was it lifting assistance? Um, Sharon mentioned the DASH earlier. So um, with regard to the section GG items, a DASH indicates that there's no information. In general, this should be rare that you would say no information. Again, if somebody is not able to perform an activity due to safety concerns or a medical condition, code 88. So in general, there's not really, I don't think, for the admission uh, to report uh, dashes. So try and use the codes 7, 9, or 88 as much as possible. Think through that before you would think about using a dash. So again, CMS expects DASH use on the admission and discharge performance items to be a rare occurrence. Do not use a DASH if the item was not assessed because the person refused, the item was not applicable, or there was a safety concern. Use of DASH for the admission and discharge performance items may uh, result in a payment reduction. So hence my um, reinforcement of that. Completion of at least one discharge goal on the admission assessment is required for the quality measure. If you choose to only report one goal, you may enter dashes in the other goal items that as long as you have at least one goal, dashes in the other goal items would not result in a payment reduction. But again, you must have at least one goal. If the person's care plan includes multiple function goals related to self-care mobility, for example, like the case study that you'll be looking at shortly, it's great if you would report those goals in there as um, reported in the care plan. But again, if you choose to just report one goal and put dashes for the rest, there would not be a payment reduction. So while a DASH should be a rare occurrence in the admission and uh, admission performance and the discharge performance, use of the DASH encoding of the discharge goal is permitted. And again, uh, using the DASH in this allowed instance does not affect the annual payment update determination as long as you've got one goal in. So next, we're going to um, go through the different items. So I think... Um, we're scheduled for a break in a little bit. So we'll get through, I think, a couple of items, and then we'll pick up after break. OK, great. I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming back on time. Um, I think we're ready with the slides. So we're starting to talk about the items. Great, thank you. Um, so we're going to start off, um, so we're on slide 36, uh, which is the eating item. And so what we're going to do for um, the three self-care activities is I will be going over the definition. We'll have some um, case little scenarios that we do together, just short examples to reinforce the definitions and the scoring scale. And um, some of them are polling. So um, you previously identified somebody to be your official response uh, person, so you can switch to another person if you'd like at this point. Uh, there's quite a few. We will actually be going for up until lunch, so we'll, we've got about two hours. Um, probably there will be time for some questions. 
if you could maybe quiet down, thank you. Um, so there will probably be an opportunity for questions, but I would also encourage you to submit questions online if you're able to, or to write questions on the cards. Um, we will be taking questions from all of the presentations this morning after we get back from lunch. So I think we're all set to go. Okay, so um, again, we're going to start off with the first um, item, which is eating. And with eating for section GG, it is defined as the ability to, to use suitable utensils to bring food and liquids to the mouth and swallow food once the meal is presented on a table or tray. It includes modified food consistency. So a couple of things um, in terms of just <laughs> some questions that have come up to kind of solidify the definition. So it is both um, eating uh, solid food and drinking liquids, that is included. Um, we've had a question where somebody said, well, what if the person uh, eats finger foods and they eat with their fingers? Do you have to use a knife and fork? And the answer is no, you can use your uh, uh, fingers might be a suitable utensil depending on the food. So um, I think that's probably enough on that definition. That. Okay, so this happens to be one of examples we'll go through together. Um, so I will read the example and I will give you um, a minute to just talk in your t amongst yourselves at your table and uh, then we'll go through the answer together. So this is not a polling one. I think the next one is. So we have an example, Miss S has multiple sclerosis affecting her endurance and strength. She prefers to feed herself as much as she's capable. After eating three fourths of her meal by herself, Miss S usually becomes extremely fatigued and requests the assistance from a certified nursing assistant to feed the remainder of the meal. So how would you code eating for Miss S and what is your rationale? And if you want to yell out the answer, if you know it, feel free. Okay. Great. Okay, so many of you gave me three fingers or yelled out three. That is correct. So in this instance, um, Ms. S uh, was able to do most of the effort. Uh, she did need assistance from a helper. In this case, it was a certified nursing assistant. So uh, more than half of the effort was done by the resident, Ms. S, and so the correct code is level three. So the CNA provides less than half of the effort for the resident to complete the activity uh, of eating and drinking. Okay, now we have a polling scenario. So um, with this particular example, I'll read it to you and then you'll be able to enter your response in the gadget at your tables. And I just wanna be sure everybody's clear that your um, uh, responding based on the letters. The polling devices have both numbers and letters, but I think because you got all the answers right earlier today, you probably realized that. Okay, so we've got a, um, a resident named Mr. R who's unable to eat by mouth due to a swallowing problem. And this is a um, result of a stroke that he had recently. So he receives nutrition and fluids through a G-tube, and the G-tube um, uh, fluids and nutrition are administered by nurses. Prior to the stroke, he ate by mouth. So I will let you work as a group on this particular example. And actually, let me leave it up here for a second so you can look at it and then talk at your table what you think the correct response is, and I will give you a bit of time. So if you believe the correct response is 88, code, or press A. If you believe the correct response is two, press B. If you believe the correct response is three, press C. If you think the correct response is nine, press D. Um, I'm getting a signal that the polling is closed. Is that? Yes, okay. So I think, um, is there, let's see, is, is Bridget? Um, 
Are you able to enter anything or no? No, okay, so nobody's, okay, Mark is on the case. Thank you, Mark. Okay, um, I do want to keep going. Um, I don't want to delay things further, but I think Mark's going to look into what's going on. Um, okay, well, um, the correct response was uh, is A, and 100% of you who were able to get that in, uh, entered uh, gave the correct response. So as I mentioned earlier, we are really concerned with eating in terms of somebody's ability to eat and drink by mouth. So if somebody's on a G-tube, um, we do not code the assistance related to G-tube. Um, we actually, as part of the testing for these items, we did look about coding G-tube feeding separately, but it actually did not end up being um, an item that got put onto any of the data sets. So um, eating is truly just eating by mouth. Okay, so the next um, item on the data set is oral hygiene. Oral hygiene is defined as the ability to use suitable items to clean teeth. So in uh, many cases, it'll be brushing teeth. It could absolutely include, for individuals who do not have teeth, it could be cleaning gums, very acceptable. Um, it may involve uh, mouthwash, things like that. In fact, the case study will ask you, will give you a, an example where somebody is using um, mouthwash as well as dentures. So for dentures, if applicable, it would include the ability to remove and replace the dentures from and to the mouth and to manage the equipment for soaking and rinsing them. So we have an example that we'll do together. Um, so Mr. W is a resident who does not have teeth and his dentures no longer fit his gums. Mr. W begins brushing his upper gums after the helper applies toothpaste onto his toothbrush. So um, opening the toothpaste and applying toothpaste on a toothbrush is an example of setup for oral hygiene. He brushes his upper gums but cannot finish due to fatigue. The helper completes the activity of oral hygiene by brushing his back upper gums and his lower gums. So in this instance, uh, Mr. W gets started, but it looks like the helper, in this case, we, so it might be a nurse or it might be um, somebody else, the helper is actually brushing his back upper gums and the entire lower gums. So how would you score oral hygiene and what is your rationale? I hear some twos, okay. Um, I agree with that. So um, in this case, he was performing less than half of the effort. The helper was performing more than half of the effort because the helper did all the lower gums plus part of the top of the gums. One example that we, or a question that we've had is, what if somebody kind of, you know, brushes their teeth or brushes their gums but doesn't do a very good job, and so a helper actually kind of does some uh, oral hygiene for the person. And so in that instance, if the helper provides assistance, you would code that, um, and then it would be depending on whether the person, uh, the helper did more than half of the effort or less than half of the effort. So again, it's always how much assistance is being provided. So now we've got another polling scenario. In this case, we actually have the situation where a nurse is trying to code the item and needs to get information from another source, in this case, a certified nursing assistant. So she starts off asking the CNA, does Mrs. K help with brushing her teeth? And so the CNA says, she can help clean her teeth. So then the nurse has to get more detail, so she asks, how much help does she need to brush her teeth? And in this case, the certified nursing assistant says, she, need, she usually gets tired after starting to brush her upper teeth. I have to brush most of her teeth. So how would you code this uh, patient or this resident, Mrs. K, for oral hygiene? Okay, you can enter your, your polls, and it looks like the polling is open. Uh, if you believe the correct response is five, press A. 
If you believe the correct response is four, press B. If you believe the correct response is two, press C. If you believe the correct response is three, plus, press D. Okay, I'll give you a bit of time. Okay, I think it's quieted down. So it looks like 97% uh, coded this uh, C, level two, which I agree with level two. Um, so in this instance, the helper was providing more than half of the assistance, and so it was coded two. If the helper was doing less than half of the assistance, it would have um, been a three, and if it was just touching assistance, it would have been um, B. But the correct response for this is indeed C. Okay, the third self-care activity on the MDS is called toileting hygiene. So again, this definition is really important. We've got a lot of questions about this particular item. Um, so the definition is the ability to maintain perineal hygiene, adjusting clothes before and after using the toilet, commode, bedpan, or urinal. If managing an ostomy, it would include wiping and opening, but not managing the equipment. So basically what this refers to is when somebody is um, voiding or having a bowel movement, uh, there is the clothes, if somebody's wearing pants and underwear, somebody or the person is pulling their pants down, somebody is doing some wiping, perineal, perianal hygiene, and then somebody is uh, pulling the underwear and pants back up. So there's three tasks within this activity, um, basically pants down, cleansing, pants back up. And so that's really what you're scoring, how much assistance with those activities. So toilet transfer is not included within this. So if somebody needs help to get up off the toilet, that's gonna be scored elsewhere. So be warned, some of our examples are a bit tricky because we those things do happen together, so you have to kind of split it up in your mind. But um, in general, it is, again, pants down, cleansing, pants back up. So when you're thinking about who's doing more than half of the effort, less than half of the effort, you can think through out of these three tasks, who is doing what. So if the helper is doing let's say one of the tasks, maybe the person is helping to pull the pants down because the person, maybe it's um, an, uh, a, a person who has some uh, urinary um, uh, um, urgency, and so there's kind of a hurry to make sure that the pants are down quickly, and so maybe uh, the helper does that, and then the patient is able to sit down on the toilet, the person is able to cleanse, and the person is not in a hurry anymore, so she can pull up her own pants. And so in this case, it was really the assistance with pulling the pants down. So that would be about a third of the activity of toileting hygiene. So in this case, the helper was doing less than half of the effort. But there was definitely assistance with the activity. So I hope that helps us kind of setting the stage for this item. Okay, so we have an example to do together. Um, so Mrs. J uses a bedside commode. The certified nursing assistants provide steadying, touching assistance as Mrs. J pulls down her pants and underwear before sitting on the toilet. When Ms. Mrs. J is finished voiding or having a bowel movement, the certified nursing assistants provide steadying assistance as Ms. J wipes her perineal area and pulls her pants and underwear up without assistance. So if we think through the three tasks involved with toileting hygiene, um, she is pulling down her pants and underwear. She does the cleansing, and then the helper is providing steadying, touching assistance as she is um, doing the perineal hygiene and also pulling her, her pants back up. So how would you code Toileting hygiene for Mrs. J. Okay, I hear some fours out there. So I agree. Um, the steadying assistance was provided while she was doing perineal hygiene, as well as when she was pulling her pants up and down. 
theoretically, if she just needed studying assistance with one of those uh, tasks, she would still be coded the same level four. And there, again, the rationale is that it's studying assistance being provided as those tasks are occurring. So we have a uh, polling scenario next, so get your devices ready. Um, so this text is a little bit longer. So Mr. C has Parkinson's disease and significant tremors that cause intermittent difficulty for him to perform perineal hygiene after having a bowel movement in the toilet. He walks to the bathroom with close supervision. So does that matter if, if he needs help walking to him from the bathroom? No. So just you don't need to worry about that as part of this activity. Um, he walks to the bathroom with close supervision and lowers his pants, but asks the certified nursing assistant to help him with perineal hygiene after moving his bowels. He then pulls his pants uh, up without assistance. So um, just to kind of walk through, so he um, lowers his pants, the helper assists him with perineal hygiene, and then he pulls his pants back up. So we will now um, have you enter your response for each table, please. Um, if you believe the correct response is five, press A. If you believe the correct response is four, press B. If you believe the correct response is two, press C. If you believe the correct response is three, press D. I'll give you a minute to talk. Okay, are you close, do you think? Okay, I'll give you a little bit more time. Okay. All right, so let's see. Um, okay, so 97% of you uh, coded D, and that is indeed the correct response. Oh, can I explain why? So... Um, Let's see, let me go back and walk through it. So um, he pulled his pants down, the helper did the cleansing, and then he pulled his pants back up. So out of the three tasks that are in this activity, he did two out of three, and so it's more than half of the effort. Does that help? I'm not sure who asked for the clarification. Does that help? Okay, so if I had... Um, let's say I changed the scenario and somebody helped him pull down his pants, somebody helped him cleanse, and then he pulled up his own pants. I would say that that's more than uh, half of the effort by the helper, and I would code that at two, so that would shift. So does that, somebody up here seem to understand that? Does that make sense? Okay. All right, we do have a, um, a case study coming up also. Um, let's see, there have been some questions about this. Maybe I'll, I'll um, put this in here too. So we've had um, questions that have come in where somebody, let's say, does a bowel program in their bed and they don't get on or off a toilet. Let's say somebody has a, um, um, they use um, um, adult diapers and um, for voiding, and maybe they do a lot of their uh, bladder and bowel management in the bed. So the questions come up, do you have to get on and off a toilet? And the answer is no, because the toileting hygiene can happen in a bed. So if somebody is um, doing a bowel program in the bed, let's say we're just scoring a scenario where somebody has a bowel program, there is um, somebody is you know, doing, giving a suppository of part of the bowel program, the person has um, a pad on their bed, they um, have a bowel movement, the question would be who helps with managing the clothing before and after the, um, I guess, the bowel program, including the suppository part, and then who does the cleansing. So that would basically be what you would code. So similar to if it was exactly the same situation, but it was being done in bed, so the patient, the resident was able to pull down his pants, um, maybe, um, so whoever gives the suppository gives the suppository, we don't worry about that. The helper, let's say, does the uh, perianal hygiene after the bowel movement, and the resident pulls his pants back up uh, while he's in bed, that would be coded the same as this gentleman. Um, so he, 
In this case, the patient was doing more effort than the helper, and so it would be coded a level three. So I hope that helps. So toileting hygiene, pants down, cleansing pants back up. That's, that's all that is. Okay, great. So now um, we've covered the three self-care activities. The next section of the presentation, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about goals. The information that I'll be providing is mainly focused on the reporting of the self-care goals. Again, this is in the second column of the um, MDS section GG page for self-care. So this is GG0130, discharge goal, so it's the second column. Again, you can report goals for eating, oral hygiene, toileting hygiene. If you choose to do the minimum, you would at least have to report one self-care or mobility goal for the quality measure. So within the goals column, you may only enter the six-point rating scale, so one through six. Um, so you couldn't have a goal, for example, that the person refused to perform an activity. So the codes of 7, 9, and 88 cannot be used. If you want to put a goal and it's not something somebody would be able to maybe do or they'd be dependent, just code at a level 1. So again, 1 through 6 is the only uh, code that can be entered for goals. Licensed clinicians can establish a residence discharge goals at the time of admission based on discussions with the resident and family, based on professional judgment and the professional um, standard of practice. Goals should be established as part of the resident's care plan. So if you remember when I talked about the quality measure, the name of the quality measure, measure mentions care plan, and the care plan would have a goal, again, based on input from the, the resident and family member, and then your evidence to us that your your plan includes function is that you would be reporting one goal. Um, I do want to emphasize that, um, as Jen mentioned earlier, that this is really focused on the SNF Part A PPS stay. So when I say discharge, I'm referring to the end of the Part A stay. So if um, you have a resident who is admitted, um, maybe they were living in, a, in your, the nursing facility side, uh, prior to the, let's say the person had a stroke or a hip fracture, and so they're getting a short stay focused on improving mobility and self-care activities, and so that Medicare Part A stay um, is what we're concerned about, and the goal would be the time of the end of the Part A stay, not uh, past that point. So I hope that makes sense. A minimum, uh, again, a minimum of one self-care or mobility goal must be coded on the five-day PPS assessment. Clinicians may code one goal for each self-care mobility item um, in section GG. So one of the frequently asked questions we've had is, how should a discharge goal be documented in GG if the resident is expected to remain in the facility after the Part A PPS day ends? So the response is, the goal should reflect the resident self-care mobility goals at the end of their Medicare stay. So that just reinforces what I said before. So in some instances, the goals will be that the resident has improvement in an area. So it's possible that the goal or the admission assessment, let's say I'm going to make something up, is a three. And then maybe the goal is that the person goes up to a level five or maybe even a level six so that the person would be independent by the end of the Medicare Part A stay. So in that instance, the clinician determines that the um, improvement is expected and that higher score, because again, we have higher score means more independence. And so you would report three on admission and then a five as the discharge goal. So we have a little bit more of an example here on the slide. Um, of another situation where the person, let's say, it, it could be that somebody is a level three on admission, and let's say um, the person is not expected to improve in that particular activity by the end of their Part A stay, and so the 
level may remain the same. That's still a goal that they would maintain their functional level for that particular item. So in this instance, the clinician determines that a medically complex resident is not expected to progress to a higher level of functioning during the SNF Medicare Part A stay. However, the clinician determines that the resident would be able to maintain their admission functional status. The clinician discusses functional status goals with the resident and family as appropriate, and they agree that maintaining function is a reasonable goal. In this scenario, the discharge goal is coded at the same level. So if it was a three on admission, it might be a three at discharge, or as the discharge goal, sorry. The um, scenario may also be that the person is independent with a particular activity, so maybe eating is uh, not something, maybe somebody's experienced a hip fracture, and so they're independent with eating on admission, and the goal is to maintain their independence with eating. So there are six on admission, meaning independent, and the goal is to maintain uh, level six. That's perfectly appropriate, too. It is also possible that some individuals may um, have a condition in which they are um, declining. And so in this instance, the goal may be to limit the decline. And so in the slide, we have an example. The clinician determines that a resident is expected to rapidly decline and that the skilled therapy services may slow but not prevent the decline in function. In this situation, the discharge goal is lower than the admission assessment performance score. So perhaps the person came in at a level Four, um, the person just required supervision, but maybe um, they have a condition in which the swallowing problem for eating is expected to get worse, and so maybe the goal is that they would be a three, um, and so the discharge goal would be a three for the end of the Part A DPS day. Okay, so what we're going to do next is um, go through a case study um, for those of you who are, well, so for those of you who are here um, in Schaumburg, you can look in your packet and you have a case study, you have an, uh, a coding sheet, and what I'd like you to do is to work at your table and score the three self-care activities, the admission performance and the discharge goal. For those who are online watching, uh, if you go to the SNF QRP website uh, on the training tab, you will see that there is a, um, a zip file which has, uh, I believe it's a second uh, group of materials um, in the download section. And if you open that up, you'll see the case study there. You'll see the response sheet. And so you can work on this um, also if you're watching online. So I think we'll spend about 10 minutes uh, working on this as groups, and during the 10 minutes, I will be walking around in case there's any questions or somebody, um, you know, just wants to check on something, happy to address any questions, and then we will convene in a little bit once you've uh, been able to review those examples, read the scenario, and uh, we'll go through the, the coding together. So again, you're just doing self-care admission performance and discharge goal. Okay, I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, so we will come back to um, our uh, Miss J when we talk about mobility. So you'll, you'll get to read more about her in a minute, um, or I guess in a little bit. But um, I did want to go through at least the self-care uh, areas. So, um, I guess the first area is performance on admission. And so there was a um, uh, physical therapy evaluation as well as an occupational therapy evaluation. And so m most of the self-care information was in the uh, OT assessment. There was a lot of other information, but of course that's the nature of medical records. So you kind of have to find the relevant information. So um, for example, if you read through the PT assessment, you saw car transfers. Well, that's not actually an activity that's on the MDS, but again, you would encounter that kind of information in medical records, and so it's there just as kind of 
This is what you'd be faced with. So for eating, um, the occupational therapist said um, Mrs. J was able to feed herself after staff set up her meal, um, and that included opening containers, cutting meat, and buttering bread. So how did you uh, score this or code this particular item, eating? I hear a lot of fives. I agree. Okay. Terrific. Oh, and by the way, I want to thank Carol Schwartz from RTI, who is helping to answer questions with me. Thanks, Carol. Um, okay, next, oral hygiene. So um, this is a bit longer to read. So we have this example. Um, the occupational therapist says Miss J was able to remove her dentures from her mouth, rinse them, and place them in the cup to soak. After mouthwash was opened for her, so a helper is opening mouthwash, she was able to put it into a cup and rinse her mouth independently. So the word independent is there, but there's assistance provided. So that's, you know, not uh, technically correct according to our rating scale, but this is stuff that you see in medical records a lot, so I hope that didn't distract you. Um, she, if she needs help with setup, she is not technically independent on this rating scale. So, but that, that's written a lot. Um, in our case studies that we provide on slides, we usually try and talk about the person does it him or herself. Everyone, I think we do have maybe one example where we use independent to see if you got tricked into scoring six. But um, just be careful uh, because in the medical record, you might see different things, but you should code based on assistance provided, not a label um, that somebody provides if you've got more information. So um, she was able to remove the dentures from soaking and rinse them, uh, but required assistance to open the tube of denture adhesive. She was able to independently apply the denture adhesive and place her dentures back in her mouth. How did you code her for oral hygiene? Everybody five, I'd see. Okay. There is setup assistance. So opening the mouthwash and opening the uh, denture uh, tube of denture adhesive. So that would, those are examples of setup assistance. Within the self-care activities, there are a lot of things that helpers will do to set up. So eating, it's opening containers. With um, oral hygiene, it's, you know, toothpaste, toothbrush, opening up those little, um, you know, um, things, which can be difficult. Okay, next activity is toileting hygiene. And, um, so with this particular activity, let's see, this was also the OT after the toilet transfer, she writes, um, Ms. J was able to perform her own perineal hygiene after supplies were set up for her. So maybe somebody passed her the toilet tissue. That would be an example of set up. She required the assistance of one staff member to manage her disposable incontinence pad and pull up her pants and, un and underwear um, up and down. So um, if somebody wears um, incontinence pads or um, an adult diaper, um, that is considered clothing. Basically, it's, you know, kind of the underwear in, in that um, situation. And so assistance with managing uh, diapers or um, whatever products are being used um, would, would include, um, would mean that assistance is being provided. So in this case... Um, she does her own cleansing. Um, so she's well, so the setup says she can't be a six, so she's at least a five or below. And then it says she does her own perineal hygiene, so she's doing something. But then it also says one staff member is managing her, uh, pulling her pants up and, let's see, her pants up and down. So what do you think? I see a two, two, yeah, I agree with that. Perfect. Okay, goals. Goal, so goals were a little bit easier in this case. Um, she is in for a short stay, and she's probably going home because by discharge, it says the occupational therapy um, evaluation is that, um, let's see, by discharge... Okay, it says long-term goals. Resident will independently set up and eat uh, and drink meals and snacks. So independent, right? 
And then it says she will independently complete her oral care. So she would be independent for coding, the goal. And then for toileting hygiene, uh, she's expected to be independent. So again, six. So six for all three activities. Okay. So again, we'll come back to the case study. But next, I want to go through the mobility activities. There are more mobility activities. And one of the things that um, you'll notice if you look at the form is, um, so if you turn into the second page, if you're looking at your packet, within the area of mobility, there's actually three columns. So the first column is similar to self-care in that you will be reporting the admission performance for the mobility items. The mobility performance items, by the way, are GG0170. In the second column on the admission form, is room for goals. The third column are used for some of these questions that are basically um, what we call gateway questions. So for example, we um, there are items on the data set asking about whether the person walks or if the person uses a wheelchair. If you say that the person is, let's say, not using a wheelchair, you do not need to respond to the wheelchair items. So coding that item is basically yes, no. We'll go through exactly what they are in a few, few slides, but it's not the six level rating scale. So there's a separate rating scale for that third column. So that's why we kind of put it off to the side. So again, the um, first column on the admission form is the admission performance for mobility items. You can use the 06 um, through 01, plus the 88, 9, and 7 that we talked about for self-care. Second column is goals, that 1 through 6 can be used, and then the third column has unique codes that we'll go through together. On the discharge form, you are, um, you'll see two, col two columns, basically. The first column is the discharge performance, and the second column on the discharge form is basically those um, the gateway and follow-up questions again. Rationale for these items, similar to what we talked about before in terms of mo um, mobility and self-care being important um, for all residents. Mobility limitations on admission means that somebody is at risk for further decline potentially if they're not up and about, if they're not performing their daily activities. And so that's, again, the focus of these particular items. The steps for assessment are very similar. So you assess the resident's mobility abilities based on direct observation. You can supplement that with self-report from the person, reports from the clinician, care staff, and family member, um, information that's documented in the medical record. The admission assessment is a three-day period in which the um, day of admission counts as day one. And then the discharge assessment is the last three days of the Medicare Part A stay. Residents, again, should be allowed to perform the activities as independently as possible. This is an assessment. Um, so as long as they're safe, they should be allowed to be as independent as possible. If helper assistance is required because of unsafe or poor quality, score according to the amount of assistance provided. Activities may be completed with or with or without assistive devices. You'll definitely see more examples in the mobility area where people are using devices. So just code device, um, the person using whatever devices they're currently using. If a resident's mobility performance varies during the assessment period, first of all, make sure they're all assessments as opposed to the person you know just got brought into the SNF and somebody provided a lot of assistance to get them into the bed the first time, but they really don't need that level of assistance. So you would ignore that and you'd say, okay, what is, let's allow the person to be as independent as possible as part of the assessment. And you might have a couple of um, instances where the, let's say, uh, physical therapist, occupational therapist, a nurse might be doing these transfers. And so then you would make sure that you were talking to determine the patient, the resident's um, admission assess ability. So it is their usual assessments, not the most independent or most dependent, but their usual. 
Consistent with self-care, you would report information based on facility, federal, and state policies that follow the procedures um, similar to self-care. Um, again, it must be done in compliance with facility, federal, and state requirements. So the rating scale is the same. I'm not going to go through this in depth, but I will just reinforce some things. So independent means that the person completes the activity by him or herself. Um, if setup is needed, the person is not independent. So. Level five, the person requires setup or cleanup assistance. Um, we've had questions where people say, okay, what if they just need setup assistance, they do their own cleanup, or the other way where somebody has to do cleanup, but the person sets themselves up. If either or both are true, it's a level five. So cleanup or setup or both. Level four, again, is supervision or touching assistance. Um, this includes quite a few ex examples um, of things that can happen. Things like contact guard or steadying assistance are kind of within the realm of touching steadying assistance. Level three, the uh, resident is doing a lot of effort. The helper does less than half of the effort. So the helper is providing some lifting, the, the, re, the helper is providing some trunk support, uh, the helper is holding um, the person's limbs, perhaps. Code two would be used when the resident is doing less than half of the effort, so the helper is doing a significant effort, hence substantial maximal being the label here. And level one dependent is coded if the helper is doing all of the effort and the resident does none of the effort to complete the activity, or in instances where two helpers are required for the resident to perform a single activity. That would be a one automatically. Again, if somebody refuses to perform an activity, maybe walking or maybe the person's in a wheelchair and they refuse to um, um, get into and wheel their wheelchair, that would be a code of seven. Nine is not applicable. 88, again, probably the most common reason that you'll indicate an activity did not, was not attempted or did not occur. And this is um, not attempted due to a medical condition or safety concern. So we've talked about the assessment and Jen covered this earlier today. So the coding tips that are in the manual, just to um, review those, very similar to what's in the self-care area. When reviewing health records, interviewing staff, and observing the resident, be sure you're familiar with the definition of each activity. For example, when assessing walk 50 feet with two turns, determine the level of assistance required to walk 50 feet while making two turns. On the five-day PPS assessment, code the resident's usual performance using the six-point scale or code the reason an activity was not attempted, as well as the resident's discharge goals using the six-point uh, rating scale. Instructions above related to the discharge goals for mobility are the same as the um, guidance that um, I spoke about earlier about the self-care activities. On the Part A PPS discharge assessment, code the resident's usual performance using the six level um, point scale or code the reason the activity was not attempted. Again, a discharge uh, code actual ability, not the best, not the worst, but they're usual if there is differences during the assessment period. Do not record the staff's assessment of the potential capability, score what you actually see. If the resident does not attempt an activity or does not complete an activity, code the reason, so the seven, nine, or 88. Don't put a dash because the person was too ill to complete an activity. If two or more helpers are required to, to complete one activity, code level one. And to clarify your own understanding of observations of the resident's performance or activities, if you're needing to interview somebody, you will probably need to ask questions to get specifically at the level of assistance. I mentioned the dash before. Um, Jen mentioned it earlier today also. A dash indicates no information. 
for the admission and discharge self-care mobility um, performance, it should be rare that a dash would be used. Um, again, if the person can't perform an activity, just mainly you should go first to 7988, putting a dash um, uh, may re for the admission and discharge performance items may result in a payment reduction. Com for the goals, same as what I mentioned under the self-care area, for the quality measure, you must report at least one goal. Uh, for the self-care or mobility items, if you choose to not report all of the items, you may enter a dash into the goals. Uh, while a dash would be a rare occurrence, use of the dash for coding the discharge goal is permitted, permitted, and using the dash in this allowance does not affect the APU. Okay, so we did go through these questions before I'll go through them just for reinforcement. So maybe you're thinking about, um, you know, one of the examples we've talked about, it applies to also the mobility activities. So once you know the definition of what we're thinking about, so if it's toileting hygiene or walking 150 feet, you'd say, does the resident need assistance to complete a mobility activity? Assistance, of course, as we've talked about, could be physical assistance, verbal, nonverbal cueing, setup, cleanup, any of that kind of assistance counts. If the person does not need any of the other assistance, level six. If the person does need at least one type of assistance that I mentioned, the code would be lower. So you ask the next question, does the resident need only setup or cleanup assistance from one helper? If the answer is yes, you would code five. If the answer is no, you'd ask the next question. Does the resident only need verbal, nonverbal cueing or studying touching assistance from one helper? If the answer is yes, code four, which is called supervision touching assistance. If the answer is no, we'll go down to the next question. Does the resident need lifting assistance or trunk support with one helper providing less than half of the effort? If the answer is yes, code three. If the answer is no, we have to ask about more than half of the effort, more than half of the effort by the helper would be coded too. If that's not correct, then we go down to our last question, which is does the helper provide all of the effort to complete the activity or is the assistance of two or more helpers required to complete the activity? The answer is yes to that last question, the code is one. If the activity was not attempted, indicate why, 7988, I think you could probably tell me what those mean this point. Okay, I do want to go through the examples, again, reinforcing definitions that are on your sheets and talking through some examples. So the first activity is um, GG0170B, which is sit to lying, the ability to move from sitting on the side of the bed to lying flat on the bed. So the first example we have here is actually a polling scenario. So if you can get out your devices and maybe somebody else's turn to press the button for the mobility items so you can switch around. All right, or maybe somebody's being very nice and doing all of them. <laughs> um, so in this uh, example, uh, Mrs. H requires assistance from a nurse to transfer from sitting at the edge of the bed to lying flat on the bed because of paralysis on her right side. The nurse lifts and positions Mrs. H's right leg. Mrs. H uses her arms to position her upper body. Overall, Mrs. H performs more than half of the effort. So I will let you talk about this amongst your, your table. If you believe this example um, the correct response is five, press A. If you believe the correct response is four, press B. If you believe the correct response is two, press C. If you believe the correct response is three, press D. And I will start the clock. Okay, um, go ahead and press your buttons. Okay. Uh, looks like 94% of you coded D, which is level three, and I do agree with that response. Um, looks like a couple of people coded substantial maximal assistance. So let me go back real quick here. 
So um, there was lifting assistance because of the leg, so definitely we know it's a three or below. Um, in this instance, uh, she used her arms to position her upper body, so she was definitely very involved. And it does say Mrs. H performed more than half of the effort. So again, if the resident is doing more effort than the helper, um, the correct response is level three. Okay, the next activity, um, so we're still kind of doing the bed mobility stuff. So in this instance, the person um, would be assessed lying to sitting on side of bed, and that is defined as the ability to safely move from lying on the back to sitting on the side of the bed with feet flat on the floor and with no back support. So we have one example to do together here. So we've got Miss P who is being treated for sepsis and has multiple infected wounds on her low extremities. Full assistance from the certified nursing assistants is needed to, to move Miss P from a lying position to sitting on the side of her bed because she usually has pain in her lower extremities upon movement. So what do you think? Okay, great. I hear a lot of ones, that's right. So this was a somewhat easy example. Um, the helper fully provided assistance with the activity of getting from lying to sitting on the side of the bed. The next um, activity in the mobility area is sit to stand. And this refers to the ability to safely come to a standing position from sitting in a chair or on the side of the bed. So um, we have an example to do together where Mr. M has osteoarthritis and is recovering from sepsis, Mr. M transitions from sitting to a standing position with steadying or touching assistance from the, nurse, um, from the nurse's hands on Mr. M's trunk. So again, touching, steadying assistance for uh, getting from sitting on the side of the bed to a standing position. How would you code this? Okay, I hear a lot of Fours, and I do agree with that, supervision, touching assistance. In this instance, the touching part of it. Um, so that is correct. The next activity is chair, bed to chair transfer. So if um, a person is in a wheelchair, they might be getting from a wheelchair back into bed. They could be going from a wheelchair into a chair. If somebody is... Um, uh, just getting, uh, doing a stand pivot, they can get from a, their bed into a chair, any type of chair. Um, it, could, it could be a wheelchair. They could use a slide board or a transfer board. For this particular item, we're looking at getting from, you know, one location to the other, and it's safely um, and getting from bed into another, another chair or wheelchair. So we have an example here to go through together. Um, for this scenario, Mr. F has medical conditions including morbid obesity, diabetes, and sepsis. He recently underwent bilateral above the knee amputations. Mr. F requires full assistance with transfers from the bed to the wheelchair using a lift device. Two certified nursing assistants are required for safety to um, get him from the bed to the wheelchair. Mr. F is unable to assist with the transfer from his bed to the wheelchair. So how would you code that? One, right. And the rationale is that the two helpers were required. There was this, um, you know, maybe a Hoyer lift. And so um, it required the assistance of two helpers. And so that automatically means there's um, a significant burden associated with requiring the assistance of two people, and that's a level one. Okay, next we get to toilet transfer. So, you know, we, we talked a lot about toileting hygiene. Toilet transfer, of course, might happen in between toileting hygiene, and so there may be situations where somebody puts their hands on the resident. There is uh, steadying assistance during the transfer, during pants down, during perineal hygiene, during pants up. And so, you know, the therapist or nurse might not actually let go of the patient, and both would be coded um, studying assistance if that's 
the level of assistance for that person. Both activities might be kind of happening together. You just think through, did I provide setting assistance during both of those activities or just during one? So uh, toilet transfer is basically just getting on and off a toilet or commode. If somebody does not get on or off a toilet or commode, you might be coding this in 88 if it's a medical issue. So we have a polling scenario here. And so um, in this example, it's Mrs. Z. So a CNA, Certified Nursing Assistant, provides studying, touching assistance as Mrs. Z transfers onto the toilet and lowers her underwear. So after voiding, Mrs. Z cleanses herself. But remember, we're just uh, coding toileting, toilet transfer here, not toileting hygiene. She then stands up as the helper steadies her, and Mrs. Z pulls up her underwear as the helper steadies her to ensure Mrs. Z does not lose her balance. So um, please talk amongst yourself. I'll give you a little bit of time on this one. Oh, let me put it back up. Um, because I want you to just tease out from what's written here the toilet transfer part of it and the assistance provided by a helper related to toilet transfer. So we don't actually need to worry about the cleansing, right? Okay, if you believe the correct response is four, press A. If you believe the correct response is two, press B. If you believe the correct response is three, press C. If you believe the correct response is one, press D. And I will give you a few minutes to talk in your group. Okay, I guess you got it. So, wow, you did get it. 100% coded for A, which I agree with. So, great. Okay, and the rationale, again, is the studying assistance, but I guess you could probably tell me that at this point. Um, oh, actually, I should... Yeah, so just um, managing clothing and the cleansing is rated under the, um, the toileting hygiene is, is not considered here, so just to be absolutely clear. Okay, so now um, if you look at your um, section GG items, this is where we get into that third column. So the first question in the third column asks, does the resident walk? So response options here are zero, no, the, which indicates the person is not walking at this point in time, and walking goal is not clinically indicated. So this is on the admission assessment. Um, if you indicate no, the person is not walking, and that a walking goal is not clinically indicated, that means you will not be able to enter any walking scores and you will not be able to enter any goals because you've just told us that walking goals are not clinically indicated. Obviously, there's circumstances where a person is not walking, but goals could be appropriate for walking. And so if that's the case, you actually code one. So if we go down to one, um, so again, the question is, does a resident walk? If you code one, that means no, the person does not currently walk, but walking a walking goal is uh, clinically indicated. So if you respond one in this instance, you will be able to enter at least uh, one or more goals for walking. If the person is walking, there's one response. Yes, the person's walking. And then you're asked to code the walking items. There's, um, the next item actually is walking 50 feet with two turns. We do sometimes get questions about these particular um, gateway questions, so I'll just go through a couple of scenarios. So the first one is, Mr. Z currently does not walk, but a walking goal is clinically indicated. How would you code this item, which um, is GG0170H1, and what is your rationale? So what do you think? So in this case, you'd code 1. He's not currently walking, but a, a goal of walking is part of his care plan. And so um, you would be able to enter discharge goals if you wanted to 
for some of the um, walking items. The, um, on the discharge form, so this is um, the second column in the discharge form. The same question is there, does the resident walk? But then in this instance, we don't have to worry about goals. So the response options are zero, no, the person does not currently walk, or two, yes, the person is walking. So we have an example here that we'll do together. At the end of her SNF PPS day, Ms. H is walking with a quad cane to all destinations in the facility and safely walks outside in the courtyard with her walker. How would you code this on the discharge assessment? Yes, you would just code yes. We have had questions about whether walking um, status on admission and discharge have to be the same, and the answer is no. So it is entirely possible that you would say on admission that walking is not currently done, it is a goal, and then a discharge, you might be saying, yes, the person's walking. Um, it is possible that you have on admission, you code that yes, the person is walking, you code two, and then if the person has um, perhaps a progressive neurologic condition, they might not be walking at the end of the PPS day, and so it's possible you might say they're not walking at discharge, and the answer would be that they're not walking, the zero. So there's no comparison of admission and discharge, just think about, oops, sorry. Just think about what's happening at admission and just what's happening at discharge. The first walking item on the MDS is walking 50 feet with two turns. And this assessment would start once the person is in a standing position. As you very well know, we've already covered a lot of the bed mobility items. We have that sit to stand activity that we've already talked about. And now we just want to know once standing, what's that person's ability to walk 50 feet with two turns. A frequently asked question that we got um, for the uh, prior training that we did and through the help desk has been, what degree of turning is acceptable to assess a resident's ability to walk 50 feet with two turns? So the response to that is that turns included in the items GG0170J, which is the walking 50 feet with two turns. And then you'll see shortly we have a wheeling 50 feet with two turns, which is GG0170R. And for both of those activities, a 90 degree turn is what we mean when we say a turn. We do have two turns. So of course people have asked, is there more specification? So the turns may be in the same direction, so I could make two right turns uh, that are 90 degrees, or I could have one right turn and one left turn. So the turns can be in the same direction, or they may be in different directions. Uh, the 90 degree turn should occur at the person's ability level and can include use of an assistive device if that what is what the person uses when they're walking or wheeling. So um, we do have a polling scenario for walking 50 feet with two turns. So if you can get out your device. Our example, Mrs. L is unable to bear her full weight on her left leg. As she walks 60 feet down the hall with her crutches and makes two turns, the CNA supports her trunk and provides less than half of the effort. So you can talk um, among your colleagues at the table and enter your code. So basically there's trunk support and the CNA provides less than half of the effort. For this example, if you believe the correct code is five, press A. If you believe the correct code is four, press B. If you believe the correct code is two, press C. If you believe the correct code is three, Press D, and I will give you a minute to go through this. Okay, you're kind of quiet. Maybe this was easy for you. Okay, it looks like 97% coded 
three, and I agree with that. Um, so the um, helper provided less than half of the effort, that's why it's a three. If the helper provided more than half of the effort, it would be a two, which was the C response. I hope that's clear. Our second walking item is walk 150 feet. Um, so this refers to, again, once the person is standing, the ability to walk 150 feet in a corridor or similar space. We have one example to go through together. Mr. R has endurance limitations due to heart failure and has only walked 30 feet during the three-day assessment period. He has not walked 150 feet or more during the assessment period, including with the physical therapist who has been working with Mr. R. The therapist speculates that Mr. R could walk this distance in the future with additional assistance. We are coding what we actually see at this point in time, so this is probably an admission assessment. And um, so at this point, the um, person is walking 30 feet. They're not able to actually complete the 150 feet. And we don't say this, but nobody is picking up the person and carrying them the rest of the distance. Um, so how would you code this? Okay, I hear a lot of 88s, that's right. So if the activity of walking can't be completed, 150 feet is a significant difference distance for some of the residents if they have significant impaired mobility. And so um, there, there is another walking item. Perhaps they were able to do some, walked 50 feet. Um, but it, in this instance, uh, we're not able to really determine the total effort that would be needed by a helper if the person was able to walk 150 feet because we don't pick people up and carry them. And so we would just say 88, the person uh, was not able to accomplish the 150 feet. The last few items in the mobility section relate to um, using a wheelchair or scooter. Um, not everybody would use a scooter or wheelchair. So we have a gateway question here, similar to what we had with walking. So on the admission assessment, this is again the third column. And the question is, does the resident use a uh, wheelchair or scooter? If the answer is no, you would skip over um, to the next section. If the answer is yes, then you would um, be prompted to um, enter codes for wheeling. The next item is, 100, is, is 50 feet with two turns for wheeling. Um, on the discharge assessment, the same question is asked. Again, it doesn't matter if there's agreement between the admission discharge. I do want to reinforce um, that this is an assessment. So if you have a resident who maybe is going to therapy and because it's on a different floor or quite far down the hall, maybe somebody is just pushing them down the hall to get to x-ray or you know therapy gym, but the person is generally walking, you are walk, working on walking during therapy, there's no wheelchair skills that the person is learning, uh, you're, you're not doing an assessment at that point. And so you'd say, no, the person is not using a wheelchair or scooter. If the person maybe can walk, but uh, they will maybe post-discharge need to use a wheelchair, and so you are walking on wheelchair skills, you have a goal related to wheelchair skills, you would be wanting to say, yes, this is based on an assessment. You would say, yes, this person is using a wheelchair. So again, this is all about assessment. I know, um, you know there are circumstances where there's policies where somebody might be put in a wheelchair and taken to x-ray or you know, whatever, um, or down to the cafeteria. But here, we're really interested in an assessment for wheelchair or scooter mobility. So the first um, item related to wheelchair mobility is analogous to the walking item where the person is wheeling 50 feet with two turns. It starts once the person is seated in the wheelchair because we already had that item that was the transfer from the bed to the wheelchair if that's the person uses a wheelchair. And so it's basically can the person wheel 50 feet and make two turns. We already talked about the two turns being 90 degrees. So we have an example to do together. 
A helper provides contact guard assistance as Mrs. Yu transfers herself from her bed to her wheelchair. Once seated in the manual wheelchair, Mrs. Yu does not need assistance as she wheels about 60 feet while making two turns. So the first bit of information, the first bullet there, do you need that to score wheeling 50 feet with two turns? No, great. I'm only asking you to code the um, R item, which is manual wheelchair, and she is able, she does not need assistance as she wheels 60 feet while making two turns. What do you think the code would be here? Right, in, independent, level six, that's right. So no assistance was needed once she was in the seated position. So again, this just reinforces the definition for wheelchair mobility. It starts when somebody is in the seated position, and that's analogous to the person when walking. We talked about it starts when the person uh, is in a standing position. One of the items um, that's relevant when uh, a person uses a wheelchair is the type of wheelchair that they use. So um, if somebody um, is using a wheelchair, we've asked you to code the amount of assistance required. Our follow-up question is, what type of wheelchair or scooter did the person use? If it's manual, you'd code one. If it's motorized, you'd code two. And again, <laughs> sorry, this is in the third column of your form. On the discharge form, we have an analogous item, same question, same responses, manual motorized wheelchair. The last item in mobility is wheeling 150 feet. Again, analogous to the previous item, it's once seated in a wheelchair or scooter. Can the person wheel at least 150 feet in a corridor or similar space? So we have one example to do together, asking, Mr. G always uses a motorized scooter to mobilize himself down the hallway, and the therapist provides cues due to safety to help him avoid running into walls. How would you code this, um, Mr. G? Okay, I see a lot of fours. I agree with that. So it's supervision touching assistance because verbal cues were being provided. There is the follow-up question again, asking what type of wheelchair. Um, in this case, he had a scooter, right? So he would be coded as, yeah, motorized in, in this particular example. So the two options are manual and motorized. Same at discharge. Okay, so now uh, we're up to goals. Um, I'm not gonna repeat much about goals because the same issues apply. Um, so I would just refer you back to the previous slides if you want to get more details, but basically, um, depending on the resident family goals, it may be that in some cases you have a goal to improve function for a particular activity. You may have a goal to maintain function, or in some circumstances, if somebody has a progressive neurologic condition, it may be that you're trying to uh, reduce how quickly the decline occurs, and so you may have a goal um, where the score is actually, actually lower than, than the goal, but again, the goal is for the care from the care plan is to, to not um, have rapid decline. So now um, we will move to the coding scenario, and uh, so if you can pull out your case study again, uh, there's obviously some more items, so we'll spend about 15 minutes um, I will walk around if there's questions for those of you looking on, watching online. Again, you've got the um, coding scenario that you could, the case study that you can look at if you go to SNF QRP, go to the training tab, go to downloads, and under the second set of materials, you'll find the case study, the coding sheets, and we will reconvene in about 15 minutes. I will walk around. I believe Carol will be able to walk around and also help. Um, we just have a little bit more time to wrap up this section, and then we'll be able to take some questions. So think about some questions you might have, too, that you'd like to ask at the mic.
Okay, I think most people should be done. Um, so uh, we have about eight, nine minutes before lunch. I did want to go through the answers. There's been some good questions. Um, we can take a few questions before lunch, and then there's a lot of time to um, address questions. And I just wanted to introduce a colleague who's going to help me wrap this up. Carol Schwartz is a research analyst with RTI International. And she, many of you met her because she was helping with the case studies. So um, I think the next part, uh, we'll just go through the answers together. I won't read everything unless there's a particular question, but if you can look at your case studies, um, sit to lying we coded as substantial maximal assistance. A lying to sitting on side of bed we also coded to substantial maximal assistance. Sit to stand, level two also. Level two substantial maximal assistance also for the chair, bed chair transfer. Toilet transfer was also a level two. Does the resident walk? The answer was no. And walking goal is clinically indicated. So because we said no, the person's not walk, you actually get to skip over the two walking items. Don't worry if you didn't, if you coded stuff, you probably put 88. Um, but if you were actually entering this into the system, it wouldn't allow you to enter. So just officially the right answer is skip. And um, if does a resident use a wheelchair or scooter? Yes. And the um, assistance was supervision touching assistance. The type of wheelchair was manual. Wheeling 150 feet was level four supervision touching. And again, manual chair. It was an excellent question somebody asked me uh, that I think is important. Um, can you code that the person walks and uses a wheelchair? And the answer is yes. There's no um, restriction that if somebody uses both modes to mobilize perfectly fine on admission discharge, just code what is actually happening. So there's, you don't have to pick one. You can have both if that's appropriate. Okay, so um, I guess um, as part of the summary, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for caring about function for all the residents you work with. It's so important. Um, it is, you know, just, we, we learn so much more over time about the importance and the long-term effects of not mobilizing. So it's just, I, again, thank you so much. Um, for section GG in terms of the summary, um, so we've discussed the GG items that are used to calculate the quality measure. Again, at this point, it's just a process measure. Are you completing the items? So just if somebody is too ill to perform an activity, just code 88. Um, during the Medicare Part A stay, residents may have self-care mobility, limitations on admission, as we've talked about, and they're at risk for further decline. So focusing on function, again, is, is so hugely important. Um, it's important for us to write all the studies coming out showing all of the problems associated with us sitting all day in front of our computers. So um, Section GG assesses the need for assistance with and establishes Medicare Part A SNF discharge goals for self-care and mobility activities. So at this point, I want to be able to address questions. We have about five minutes for questions now. We'll break for lunch, and there's more opportunity for questions, but please Feel free to come up at the mic, and Carol and I will do our best to address any questions you have now. If we need to confer with our colleagues, because we want to be sure, we want to be 100% sure on our answer, please be patient with us. But are there any questions? Okay, come on up to the mic. Come on up to the mic. Thank you. Oh, we got one right here. Yes, and could you please tell us who you are and where you're from? My name is Gloria Brent from MDS Consultants. In Section G, the um, Section G itself, we have to obtain the information from the medical record. Um, the information in Section G is not a source document. Specifically for Section GG, uh, can we use the actual documentation in the MDS as the source document and not have all of these pieces of information 
documented in various progress notes in order to pull it into the MDS. Would an option of writing a progress note as an MDS completion individual to state um, section GG functional abilities and goals coding completed, please refer to the MDS as the source document. So great question, Gloria, thank you. Um, I know CMS has a full written response about what information um, is needed to support uh, what is reported in section GG. Um, I don't have that right with me. Um, so um, we will work on trying to get that for you for this afternoon. Is, um, so Gloria, so sorry, I, I know there's, there is a, a response that's being worked on for that, um, that's a complete response. So I think we'll have to get back to you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jerry Reinhardt from Minnesota with the Benedictine Health System. My question is relating to the MDS survey process for MDS assessments. And is it going to be seen as incomplete MDS if we have multiple goals in the care plan for rehabilitation of short-stay people, but we only code one on the MDS? So just to be sure we're clear about the question, so maybe your care plan has multiple goals related to function, but you only report one on the MDS and you're concerned that... Is when they, they, there's an MDS survey, are they going to be seeing that as an incomplete or inaccurate assessment? Yet. The question still remains. I would just want to clarify. Hi, I'm Stacey Mandel. I'm the Deputy Division Director for the Division of Chronic and Post-Acute Care that's implementing all these requirements. Um, so just to clarify, when, when the training talks about the, the goal, that's the minimum necessary to be able to calculate the measure. Um, it's also the minimum necessary to um, to uh, demonstrate for annual payment update requirements to meet that 80% threshold. So that's the minimum. Um, as far as the surveyors, that is actually outside of our purview um, with what the survey teams will be looking at. Um, and I would actually direct them to talk to the, uh, the surveyor uh, component for that information. Yeah, so as Stacy said, for the quality measure, minimum of one goal, we'd love for you to report more, and that's, we can only speak to the quality measure. One more question here. Hi, Mary Jane Kachoa from MDS REI Advisor in LA. Um, regarding section GG, item R, R, and SS, um, it's based on the three-day assessment period uh, based on the usual performance. Now, what if they happen to use the wheelchair and the electric scooter for those three days for some reason? How would we code that? Okay. There are some residents who... You might have to repeat a little bit. Sorry, it's a bit hard to hear up here. So um, you're asking about the wheelchair mobility items on right. admission, and you have a three-day assessment period, and they use the wheelchair one? Uh, the wheelchair and the manual. Uh, okay, they use a motorized and a manual, manual wheelchair right. within the three-day assessment. How would we code it? So is there a usual that they use it, more? Right. I wanted to see if, is it based on the usual? Thing? Yeah, so you can actually only enter one in, uh -huh. so just pick what they normally do most of the time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Okay, we are out of time. This is perfect. Thank you. We will be addressing questions when you get back. Have a great lunch. Thank you so much.